I've got another interview on this episode of Design Today, and I'm stoked that I'm getting to the point where a reoccurring guest first appeared 28 episodes back. I can hardly believe we've made it this far, but Dano is back and on the show to continue our theme of landing your next UX job. Uh, today we're talking about making it past the stage of resumes and phone calls. Now you're in there for an in-person interview. What can you expect? What can you do to prepare? What are some hints and tricks to do to, and not to do? Ultimately, I want you to be comfortable at the next in-person interview. I want you to avoid over-interviewing and instead really show them what you're able to bring to the table. So let's get started. Yeah. Dano, what's up? Thanks for coming back on Man, the show. I'm so glad to be here again. It's such a beautiful day here. It, you know the what? last time we were, I was here, it was dark, right? It was. And so now, I and, and I don't know what it was like before, but I've heard you guys got a lot of snow. We did. And now it's just beautiful, sunshiny. I wish I was up on the mountain. I'm probably going to do that in a few days. Good for you. But yeah. You know, by the time this episode airs, it'll probably be closer to like May. <laughs> so yeah. everyone's going to be like, wait, Springtime. What? what snow is he talking about? There is no snow. It is all melted. You are nice flowers everywhere. <laughs> it's a beautiful, sunny 70 degrees. Temple Square flowers just boom. Bursting. Uh, no, it's fun to have you back on. When I uh, when we wrapped up that first podcast, yes. it was very obvious that we needed to do this again. Your podcast, the one that we did the first time. Uh, it's done really well. I've had a lot of people actually reach out and comment about uh, taking some of that feedback from that sure. podcast and implementing it. Yeah. Um, they never actually mentioned if they implemented and resulted in good or bad. So yeah, I don't know yeah, what that yeah. means. I had a kid reach out to me. Uh, I can't remember who it was, but I reviewed some stuff like some portfolio. And really, it was more like trying to like coach him as far as like steps he could take to get a job, yeah. which is just getting involved. Like there's creating the stuff, but you got to talk to the people to get it in front of people yeah. and I haven't followed up. I need to follow up with him, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it was great to talk through that stuff and to just like get feed, feedback from people who watched it and be like, totally agree. I disagree. You know, yeah, it's like, totally. You know, so. um, I actually had a couple of preconceived ideas going into that podcast and that conversation was actually insightful for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of changing my tune on a few things as sure. well. Um, no, so it was a great conversation. <laughs> After a lot of good feedback, it was obvious that we needed to have you back on. Yeah. You're just the man of insights. And part two. So part two. After you have turned in the resume and they're like, hey, we want to talk to you in person. Come in or over Skype or whatever. Let's so that's our topic. Let's chat. <laughs> yeah, that's our topic. You've uh, nailed your UX resume and now you're finally making it in for an interview. Yeah. How do you not screw it up? That's what we're talking about that today. <laughs> Don't screw it up. There's a few ways that I feel like you definitely could screw it up. I mean, here's the thing is you've interviewed more people than I have. I've been interviewed, um, not that you haven't, but I've been interviewed a lot more and have learned from mistakes. So I feel like this is a good combination sure. of like interviewing sure. and like interviewee sure. scenarios, but just um, that direction of let's let's start there though. I'm curious. Yeah. What was um, uh, give me a, one of those re maybe interviews that you screwed up? Well, I think I don't <laughs> know if it was so much a screw up as it was. No, I want the screw up. I'm trying to remember the exact <laughs> one. Honestly, what it was, was just like, like thinking that you know more yeah. than you do. Yeah. And so you try to use the little buzzwords and stuff like that. And you can just tell that they're like, okay, sweet, nice trying to impress us, uh -huh. but get on with like how you're going to be of value to us, yeah. you know? And I think that was really the one. It was actually my interview that I did for Instagram. Um, I know you I there. over I over tried because it was Instagram. Sure. I was just like, oh yeah. I, I think what it was was I interviewed um during that process we did a critique of the of Spotify. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll choose whichever app that you want. And I was like, Oh, Spotify, great. Uh -huh. And I did more um I did more questioning of him like asking his opinion yeah. as opposed to just like going full into what I thought yeah. and just owning what I thought. Like, yeah. I think this is why they did that. I think this is why they did that. And so I think that I ultimately didn't get a job at Instagram because I didn't own what I felt, what mm -hmm. I thought and, and, and that. 
And so that was, I guess, like I said, it wasn't like this ultimate screw up as far as like not knowing anything and saying stupid things. It was more just me not owning where I was at, what I did know, what I didn't know, what I thought, what I didn't think. Um, and I, 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 yeah, I think that that made them be like, meh, next. Yeah. Arnie and Grande, thank you next. You know, <laughs> just move on from me because sure. you're just the same old trying to, you know, it just felt like, I guess I got too caught up in impressing people that I was so, that I couldn't even think. And so I defaulted to, oh, what do you, what do you think about that? You know, it's funny that there's a, it's a natural tendency. I mean, there's, there's stress, there's worry, there's uh, butterflies, uh, all these different things that kind of come into play when you go into interview somewhere, especially if you're really wanting to nail this interview. Yeah. All those things can actually take you out of your normal self and turn you into someone who you're really not. Yeah. And that's actually what makes one of the interviews uh, what makes interviews difficult is you've got to find what's authentic, what's genuine. Exactly. And uh, I've picked up on a couple of things from a few people who I know are new to the industry, who I've had conversations with as they're going about the interview process that they're doing some things that I'm saying to them. I, as an interviewer, would have loved to see when oh. I have people in for interviews. Yeah. They're doing some things that I just find to be right. Um, now, I do want to preface a lot of this conversation. Um I'm gearing a lot of my thoughts for those who are interviewing for an internship, associate level, uh, maybe mid-level. I don't think some of these things that I'll talk about at least necessarily stand true for someone who's got five years of experience and up, oh, you know, okay. yeah. because there's a few things that I would expect an intern, an associate to do um, that I probably wouldn't expect somebody with more experience to do. For example, um, one of the things that I'm very okay with is when somebody comes in the interview and we start getting into some questions and they're presenting some of their work, whatever, um, if they are okay with saying that they don't have all the answers, you know, I start pressing them on something and they go, you know, that's an interesting thought. I really don't know. In order to get a good answer for that, I'd like to do some more research. Yeah. Uh, that type of stuff for that type of uh, interview, super powerful. I love that. Mm. Be okay with not having all the answers. Get comfortable with that because if I was hiring you to have all the answers, you'd be my boss. Yeah. You know, so that's why I'm saying like it's okay not to have all the answers in that, you know, experience range. So I'll gear a lot of my thoughts towards that experience yeah, range yeah, yeah. as opposed to, you know, the more senior level. So, but if you were to flip the script on that though, mm -hmm. and if you were to be hiring for someone who had five more, how would you handle that answer. I just be at that point in time, because I mean, I'm not going to pretend like I've got that much more experience than those types sure. of people. So I'd just be genuinely interested in seeing what their thoughts are. Yeah. And just seeing if maybe they do spark something. I'd be like, oh, that's a smart idea. Yeah, 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 for sure. I think authenticity, I guess in general, if, if I was to say like, hey, you could stop listening now and apply this thing. And subscribe. Yes. And subscribe <laughs> and all those things and like it and is to be authentic. And you really have to figure out what authenticity yep is for you, right? Like who you are, what you know, and that requires a certain amount of um, reflection yeah. on experiences that you've had. But also I, I would say right now where you are is you have to look futuristically, like you might not stay at the company. You're obviously going to graduate from college if, if you're in college. What am I doing right now that I could be able to reflect back upon in an interview mm -hmm. and say, here's the thing that I did in school mm -hmm. that like this wasn't in a work environment, yep. but I went out and I did this. I actually was up in Rexburg, um, uh, Idaho, just giving a, a, a minor, I got roped into a talk um, about design. Well, I was presenting to some digital marketers yeah. and my whole philosophy, which I posted it and you saw it was everyone's a designer. Yeah. And the kind of thinking behind that was that if you aren't actively doing things to be a designer, to become a designer, what are you doing? Right. Because you are going to need to utilize those skills in anything you do, whether you're a PM right. or whatnot. And so can you go out and learn empathy by saying, why did you choose the major that you did? Yeah. But doing that, but then even taking a problem. And I know we, we may have talked about this before, but finding a problem on your campus or within your internship and asking to like, like engage with that sure. and figure out how you can find solutions, problem solve on it. 
but working with difficult people in groups and whatnot is just like the perfect setting for you to then reflect back and be able to present here's what I learned yeah. here and I have a thought about this here but then authentically like you said being able to say well I don't know much about that because I haven't had much experience sure. I'd love to actually be able to get more experience in that or I need to step away and probably research more before I could say but just off the top of my head these are my thoughts I totally agree so a couple of comments off of that I think then if you're listening to this podcast and you're in school or you're preparing for that uh that upcoming interview take note of the things that you're doing, document those things that you're learning. Because if you're oh, not yeah. actively thinking about that type of stuff, like you just mentioned, I'm in a group project, I'm working through this, and I am learning all these great things, but I'm not documenting it. Yeah. Now I forgot it six months later when I need it for an interview. Yeah, right. right? So be actively engaged in documenting that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The second piece, though, I think that you're hitting on um, as far as authenticity or whatever it may be, but the idea of not having all the answers, but genuinely being interested um, is something that I, you know, I feel like it should be easy for us. Mm. As UX designers, we should be the ones who are naturally curious. Yeah. Right. And it's almost like in our job description that you don't have all the answers, but you're going to go try and research and find and then work to design for these yeah, answers. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Very much so. And so, you know, Cameron Mole, he talks about this too, where uh, designers, he gives them three different labels. I can't remember all of them, but one of them is uh, a moderator. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, moderator, facilitator, connoisseur. I think those are the three. If I mess that up, my apologies. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you're in a UX meeting and you've got QA, you've got dev, you got PM, maybe you got executive input, and then you've also got user input. Yeah. You don't have to have the answer when you walk into that meeting. Right. But if you can bring it all together and, you know, figure out how it all meshes or how it all jives together, like that is the heart and soul of what yes. UX design is. And so when you're, you know, asked those types of questions in an interview, like, okay, here's an interesting situation. What would you do? It's okay to say, oh, I don't know. Yeah. That's uh, an interesting insight. And I'd like to now do some research to figure that out. And see, it's so beautiful because you saying when you go into something, right, instead of trying to waffle about it, but you say, I don't know, but this is what I would, how I'd probably handle the not knowing. Yeah. I would probably do this step and then I would do this and then this. Yeah. Now I'm getting into how your brain thinks. Yep. When you're presented with a problem that you do not know, this is how I find the resolution, the solution. This is how I get to a good understanding so that I can actually have a conversation, right? Like you can see this in social media and, um, in, in relation to what we're talking about here, I guess what I'd really like more to get across is that interview that you have is not some like, um, it just doesn't come out of nowhere, right? Like you get an interview and it's like, what have you been doing? Sure. Because you need to have a conversation about what you've been doing, how sure. you've been thinking about these things, right? So for me, it's like, you know, actively participating and engaging and being able to grow into how are you think about problems, which people want. And I think the idea of being a facilitator, which as a designer, as in anything, like people who, as I said, like everyone should be a designer, is what lately have you facilitated mm -hmm. that you've either helped connect or learn from mm -hmm. and, and you facilitate your own learning, you facilitate group meetings at, at, at school or whatever yeah. it might be. And what have you gained from that? And I think being able to write those things down and be like, in this group, we had a member who wasn't actively participating very much. This is the thing I did. You never know when that might come up in an interview, but like, what's the time that you had a challenge, right? Yeah. Like that's an infamous question. And what they're really looking for is the problem solution thing. Emotionally, like trying to see how you handle stressful situations yeah. and think through them. Mm -hmm. And that's in any aspect. And so the more that you can put yourself in situations where you have to emotionally like control your feelings yep. or be able to think and actively think those are all instances where you can write down and then you have like this whole book of like here's one thing here's another thing and in that moment you could really like i guess pull out top things from yeah. from that little journal yeah this is why i think journal taking and i'm not great at it i'm horrible at it <laughs> but being able to write down the key like things that have happened in the past and it doesn't matter what it is 
when they, I just, I guess I would say that, and I would ask, I would ask you when you were to ask a question like that, um, some people haven't necessarily had a super dramatic experience working within a UX project per se, Sure, but they have had maybe one in a group project in school. Uh, I don't know what it is, but you want to find a relationship, but reality is like, what are they asking? Now let's pull from that book, something that's relevant Mm -hmm. to it. And if that is something that's not necessarily UX, but maybe it's a group project or even working on a project with a friend. And we have this like disagreement. You just have to be able to have this categories of things that you can just pull little like key, key ones from. Yeah. But I haven't been asked that question very much in all honesty. Like, how you've reacted to a thing. And I don't know, is that something that you ask well, again, regularly? I don't know if it's necessarily something that I would ask you in an interview, just because I know you've got a bit more experience than, you know, some of these internships that we're hiring uh, for, yeah, okay. associate level that we're hiring for. Um, one of the things that I should probably segue into is that when I'm looking at an intern and associate level designer, at this point in time, I, there's an abundance of designers in that zero to two zero to one experience range. Yeah. Right. And so on paper, a lot of them are starting to look identical. Yeah. Yeah. And so at this point in time, I've kind of come to this conclusion that they're pretty much all, they're, they're not going to like this, but they're all identical. Yeah. Right. You know, whether they've come out of some sort of boot camp or come out of school, done the same projects, and- they've done a lot of the similar things. Right. And I think we even talked about that last time I did our, our yeah. resume interview. Um, and so at this point in time, if I'm bringing them in, I know they've got this foundational piece. And so I'm really looking for things past uh, that. Yeah. And I just want to know more about you and how you're going to navigate through this interview, how you're going to navigate through stressful situations like you're talking about. Um, Uh, And so it's, it's not necessarily about the right or wrong answers to questions, more just how you're going to navigate through those types. And that's so funny to me because (laughs) you go into a UX interview or any interview really. And I will say like outside of this, the scope of, of product design and, and, and that like, you know, doctors and everything like, you better, you better well know some answers if you're going right. to be a doctor, right? right? I hope so. But if you go into an interview and you're thinking like, okay, I need to have an answer for this and this and like all this stuff, you completely forget that the interview itself is the test is like a test in itself, right? How you handle right. answering these things. So often it's like, well, I don't really care so much what they say. I care about like how they think through yep. when I ask this question, do they like try to mumble and like come up with something or do they actively like say, no, I'm like, I, I'm not really aware. And I, I would like to go do some research on that. And it's just funny to me. And it's hard because there's not a clear cut thing of what to do and what not to do. Authenticity, you know, being genuine is the most important, important piece there. Because if I ask a question and you've got an answer like that and it starts coming out, just sounding like you're talking out of your butt it becomes very apparent that you really don't know what you're talking to about, but you need to have an answer for this essay question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at the same time, oh dear. if I ask a question and you go, Hmm. And it goes silent Thinking. for like two minutes. I'm like, you don't need to have the answer. That's kind of where I'm going. Right. 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 Like, like don't think so much. Yeah. But don't start spurring crap go out of it. full on into it. Yeah. Just have that nice little in between. So I do something that I know is, I don't want to call it controversial, but I know unpopular to some people. Uh-huh. Uh, I do design challenges for my internships and my associate level positions that we hire for. Sure. Uh, and here's why. Again, I wouldn't, somebody with more experience, I wouldn't necessarily make them do a design challenge unless all their work is done under NDA and they can't share what's in their portfolio. Mm. If that's the case, I need to see something. Right, right, right. Um, and sometimes if they're an intern or associate level and they do have work that they can talk through adequately enough and like a presentation that I don't give them the design challenge. But truthfully, if I'm giving someone a design challenge, I look at it as your opportunity not to spend hours working for me, but just prepare to talk through something with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I actually think it does them a favor because if we just pulled up your portfolio of five, six projects and I just pick one of them and say, start talking about it. Do you have all your thoughts together on that project? So I actually feel like the design challenge is doing you a favor by getting all of our thoughts and questions narrowed in on the same concepts and idea. So I'll give a design challenge. 
I tell them to time box it to two to three hours. And I know that in that two to three hours, not every stone is going to be unturned. Sure. I don't think that's how the saying goes. Not every stone will be turned. Just do it in your own brain. You know what he means. You knew what I meant. <laughs> Not every stone will be turned. You won't line up all your ducks. I'm doing too many metaphors. Ducks in a row. You won't turn too many ducks. Okay, there we go. <laughs> that's that's a good one. That's the one? Yeah, I uh-huh. like that one. So I know you're not going to be able to get everything accomplished. Uh-huh. I should have just started there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I do expect to see, though, is just something that you can speak through, you know, right. Show me just the different stages of your process and just speak through it. Yeah. yeah, I just want to hear you talk. See, and, and because a lot of, a lot of kids, including myself, when you get a design challenge, your brain immediately goes to show everything, Mm -hmm. show the visual, show the this. So, and obviously you're going to give them specific, like, um, objectives that you'd like to see, but you don't need to have the objectives completely solved. Right. You can show it up to the point of like, Hey, in this time period. And I will say that, yeah, I I mean, I'll I'll speak on behalf of you, but I think if I was looking at it, I would say, where did they get within that time period? Mm -hmm. But if you can sell me on it, if you're like, sell me Mm -hmm. what you did and all Mm -hmm. that stuff. And so I, I think I talked to them up there at BYU Idaho about, about being able to sell your work and good designers, well, designers can sell their work. And by selling it is like walking people through and explaining why they did something. And I think even though you maybe didn't reach the objective completely, if you can walk me through where you got and why you got there, like the tasks that you took to get here, I'm like, okay, cool. He's thinking through that. Maybe we might need to work a little bit on the the speed in which that happens, which I think a lot of people struggle with, but it's like, wow, great thoughts. Like yeah. great. And I think we touched on that a little bit before was just the thinking process that went yeah. into this three hours. Here's what I did with three hours, but here's where my thoughts went during that. I wasn't focused all in yeah. on like visually doing this and like stressed out and stuff. I logically went through and I got it to where I could. And I think what's interesting with like critiques, we talked about that a little bit is almost as if you're presenting in a such a way that's like getting a critique and say like, here's what I got to. And then. Yep. It's like open for, you know, feedback and critique ready, ready to go. Like somebody who's able to now ask, here's what I got to like, tell me your thoughts on that. And yeah. You know, one of the things that I do like to see when somebody comes in with their presentation ready and let's say they're doing this design challenge and I've told them to time back box it to two or three hours and they adhere to it. Um, if I see that you got front loaded and like research and wireframes, I never got around to putting as much emphasis into like the high fidelity stuff. I know that you didn't know how to estimate your time appropriately. For sure. You know, and so like I see these different things that you probably didn't intend to then show, but I just saw that you clearly spent three quarters of your time asking questions, drawing up fake personas and doing some wireframes and you never got around to designing anything low fidelity or high fidelity or doing any usability testing. Um, and I'm not saying you're supposed to do all that in a three hour time yeah. block, but I want to see it balanced. Sure. I want to see that you knew at what point in time to say like, well, I had to stop here at my questions and move on uh, with more time. I would have done this. Yeah. And then I moved on to the wireframing stage and you know, there's more concepts I could have flushed out, uh, but in the time allotted, I stopped at this point and moved on here. Uh, I was just doing a a mock interview with um, a friend of mine who actually came from BYU Idaho, uh-huh. and he was preparing for an interview that he was doing with IBM. And one of the things that I really loved about his interview is they gave him a design challenge. He time boxed it. They gave him a lot more time. They wanted him to flush it out. And uh, I don't remember what the time period was, but it was closer to like six to 10 hours. Um, but he got to his wireframe stage or maybe it was a low fidelity mock and he had three different concepts. And he said, you know, I chose this concept and I ran and moved forward with it. Hindsight, I would have chosen this one instead. Mm. Uh, because what I realized as I got further down that path is that this one didn't scale. And I think that this the one that I didn't choose could have scaled better. Mm, interesting. And that was just like a gold <laughs> star for you on Light that one. Bulb. Because I love the fact that you were okay with saying like, I was in a time crunch. And I got this far and I made this snap decision, would have tested it more before I made that snap decision. But to continue on, I did this. Yeah. Hindsight would have done this. Yeah. And it's not like a, well, strike one for you. It was like, good. I'm glad you picked up on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I picked up on it. So I'm glad you picked up on it. 
Yeah. And that brings up the uh, whole, you know, the word honesty in an interview, which is part of authenticity. You mm-hmm. know, I, I feel like is being honest in here's where I'm at, you know, here's where I got to. But had I gone back, like I want, I, I would love to test this out. Actually, yeah. I was doing it. Uh, I did a design challenge for a company called Convoy, which um, is up in uh, in Seattle. They're Uber for truckers. Which, if you know now, there's actually Uber Freight, which is basically truckers can say, "Hey, I'll take that load and deliver it." Right. right? So it's very interesting. But they, that's what they essentially do. And so I was doing this design challenge, and I mean, I went to. I went to trucker forums. I was going to go to truck stops and like go and talk to truckers, Uh but I was like, I only have this amount of time. So I just went onto truck forums and I like wrote some truckers and I said, what would you guys think like would be the best thing? Nobody wrote to me. That probably peaked the audio, but nobody wrote to me. Right. (laughs) Uh, Except this one guy. And he just said, oh yeah. Like what your, your strategy behind this. I, I, I like it. Yeah. And it was basically a way to incentivize them. And then I came up with some mock-ups for it and, and this and that. Um, and during that interview, he asked me, you know, like, did you talk to anybody or did you do any research? And I was like, yeah, I went to Facebook and I wrote to some things. But had I had more time, I would have gone out to a truck stops and like taken my mocks, just very like, you know, very scrappy, just ad hoc, just yeah. ran out there and said, hey, here's a here's a concept I'm coming up with. What do you think of this? Like, would you engage with that? What would you want to see differently? Why? What What do you want to see more like from these things? So I could have written that down. But what we did do is just like these key pieces. And I do think I've struggled with, you know, breaking down time things. I mean, I still struggle with breaking things down into sure. time, right? Sure. It's very difficult to understand how long something's going to, but what's nice. And I think that this is actually something that actionable that kids in school right now, if you're out there and listening to this and like, I don't know what to do to like be ready for that interview, try doing like, go look up on Google like little tiny tests that you could do, you know, like little design challenges that you could do on your own oh, yeah. and learn how to break the time down on them. Yep. Because if you can learn how to break time down like that, and then you can figure out when somebody else gives you one, like, where should I put more emphasis yep. here, here, and here? Great. I know how long that might take me to do that. Yep. Sweet. I'm good to go. And then you yep. don't have to stress your brain out yep. and stay up later than is expected and be like, Oh, this was three hours, but I actually did like five hours. Yep. And like you can work within the bounds. And then when you get into a job, you're able to spec that out and raise your hand where needed and say, Hey, we're going to need an extra like week on this. I feel yeah. like, or I'm going to need an extra person or I'm going to need you to jump on board here. But being able to do that for sure. Yep. Like there's actually a thing that I can't remember who told me to do this. Um, well, I know who told me, but it's, um, I can't remember what it's called where you fold a plate paper uh, in half and then in force. And then you've got eight different, uh, okay. yeah, you got eight squares and it's just like you get one minute per side, you do eight minute like challenges where you just try to mock something up. Yeah. You just design, yeah. uh, give yourself a prompt and then you just create eight iterations of that yep. as fast as you can yep. and just see where you get. Like right. Cool. And, and those are the best little things to just gauge like how effective you can be in that amount of time. And you yep. can train yourself to get better and better so that when you get design challenges, it's like, I know exactly the process that I'll walk through now. So it's interesting that in this, you know, 20, 25 minutes that we've been chatting, one of the things that has kind of been skirted around, and I think intentionally is that again, specifically for somebody who's looking at an internship or associate level, beginner level design job, we're not looking to see if you're the master craftsman in this field. Yeah. We're not looking to see if you've got every single skill set. Uh, I'll speak uh, to this only because I I've spoken about this before. I'm more interested in that intern or in that interview, uh, the soft skills that you can demonstrate far more than the hard skills. Yeah, I've had our uh, the chief of product at Domo. She shared with me one thing after uh, a recent round of hiring, and she basically said when she's doing her hiring, and this is again for more VP and directorship level, the one question that she'll always ask herself is if I'm stranded in an airport on the other side of the world with this person. Will I make it home? And will I make it home happily? (laughs) That's very cool. And I love that thought process. She goes, because at the end of the day, we spend so much time with our coworkers. You know, and I I said this before too, I spend more time with my interns or the people on our our team more than I do with my own kids on a daily basis. 
sad fact, but it's the truth. Yeah, I mean, eight hours. And day. so I know, I know how much work went into preparing to marry my wife. I think I should probably not exactly do the same things, but should probably match the same amount of like thought that goes into. Uh, should I be hiring this person? Yeah. Okay. And that probably came out wrong. Should I match it? No, I'm probably gonna put more thought into who I marry. <laughs> right, right, right. Intern. But at the same time, I want to be thorough. And can I enjoy being around this person? And I hope that in an interview, even with a design challenge or your portfolio, that you can demonstrate this authentic authenticity, this genuineness that comes across very real. Because at the end of the day, in those interviews, I'm just looking to see can we get along? Yeah. Can we do this? Can we work together through these issues? Yeah. If you struggle in like the hard skills or you feel like, ah, man, I don't know all the shortcuts in sketch, or I don't know how to, you know, work inside a framer and I don't know any of these other things. That's okay. Yeah. If I need you to do it, I'll give you time to do it and we can practice at it and we can learn those hard skills. Yeah. But if you're not someone who is good at learning, and that's a skill that we'll pick up, hopefully pick up on during an interview. Or if you're not good with that stress, I'm going to start that sound bite over. <laughs> uh, if you're not good at dealing with that stress, then, you know, those are the types of things that are red flags for me. Yeah. That's what I want to try and avoid and vet out in the interviewing yeah, process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm, it's interesting because something like that, you know, just really like being personable and being social. Mm-hmm. Being able to practice that is honestly, like I mentioned earlier, is get out there and talk to people, like people that you don't know. See, it's interesting because you you always default to going and hanging out with the same people, Yeah. right? Because yeah. it's normal. It's natural for mm-hmm. you. And so you just get into the groove of like, hey, you guys want to go do something? But what if you just showed up somewhere, saw an interesting person, and just went over and said, hey, my name is so-and-so. I just want to introduce myself. I'm going up here. What, what are you studying up here? Where are you from? Or whatever, you know, the introverts listening to right to you right now are screaming. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and here's the thing is like, what do you say to internally? Them? I am an introvert. Like really, like when I'm in these scenarios, you can might consider me an extrovert because I like to talk a lot and I just like to hear from people and just have conversations. But when you get me in a group, it's super tough. But here's the thing, the introverts <laughs> look for the person in the room who looks to be similar to what you are kind of hanging back, kind of chilling and approach them one-on-one. It's so much easier as an introvert to just one-on-one with somebody than it is to try to be the whole life of the party. Yeah. And if you can't do that, it's easy enough to sit behind a computer. And this is what I actually told the, um, the, the man, I wish I remembered his name, but, um, um, I told him, I said, listen, write to people on LinkedIn like people that you know or show up at these product type events or whatever, find people who are, you know, either in HR or UX manager or just anyone really like who, I mean, focus on somebody who would be in charge of hiring and just say, Hey, I would love it if we could do like a mock interview sometime and go through this. And two things, well, two things I said, I said, you need to do informational interviews to just talk to people, but then follow up and say, Hey, I'd really like to do a mock interview with you just to help me get better interviewing and help me understand like things that I need to be, conscious of right as I'm going throughout before I get a job right. and two things will happen from that one you'll get better at talking to people and explaining and, and thinking through logically how to voice what you're doing but then two you also when you're in front of these people now they get to see who you are and it's not in this like intense mode so they get a little piece of like who you are already and my goodness can you do a mock interview if somebody said that to me and I was in a hiring pro I'd be like I'm gonna keep my eye on this kid in the future like if it, you know, if his, but it's like the pressure's off, he's going to struggle a little bit, but I at least know who he is mm-hmm. and he's working on it. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, oh my gosh. Like, I think the action, actional item number, however many we're at now is do that, reach out to, and it doesn't have to be an interview. Like, you know, it could be somebody else at your school, a teacher, another student, and just say, Hey, I'm like create your own assignment. I'm doing this assignment right now. It could be yeah. some random thing. And I just like to interview some people about like why they chose their major and stuff and just do little things to engage like that. If you, you know, if you're an introvert, yeah. if you're an extrovert, I guess, you know, I think pull it back a little bit and don't talk so much, <laughs> let other people talk more. Um, but you know, just being able to like do these one-on-one things where you can actually get people on their own and they are a little less. Yeah. So uh, that's what I think. You know, you just sparked something in my mind that uh, that I just want to share before we wrap up. You, you mentioned 
early in the podcast about how difficult sometimes it is uh, to be genuine and, yeah. and to be authentic when you get into the interviews. One of the th- things that I've recognized now in hindsight with those interviews that I've done that came across very genuine and authentic were all interviews that I've conducted with people who I had previous conversations with. Mm. So they already knew a little bit about me. I knew a little bit about them. So when we got into the room and started the interview process, we just picking up an old conversation. We weren't starting from ground zero. Yeah. And maybe that's something else that you can try and do in preparation for your next interview is who is it going to, who is it going to be that I end up interviewing with? How can I connect with them on LinkedIn uh, or maybe in a, a Slack group? Or, you know, can I create some sort of relationship with them? Not to game the system that they're going to hire their buddy, but you can get a little bit of that nervousness out if you can just start the conversation early yeah. and then just flow into it a little bit easier. Yeah, I get terrified when I've done like the speaking events. I get terrified uh, getting up in front of people. Like I hate it, hate it, hate it. Uh, just because it, I'm the introvert who doesn't like to be at the front of the room. Yeah. So one of the things that I've done that's helped me, and this is the same concept, is I'll try and go early, and for the people who show up early, I try and talk to all of them mm-hmm. because that makes me feel like when I start the presentation, I'm just talking to friends now. Right. You're already connected with the. F- mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's not just a cold room. Yeah. So I think it's the same concept <laughs> now for an interview. Is just see if you can get that conversation flowing early. Yeah, and it's so much easier to be authentic in these kind of one-on-one settings because you don't have like the pressure of people. And so if you can reach out and engage like, like you did, um, in whatever way, like you just got to figure out, you know, an environment and people and situations that you can get in that feel more comfortable and then gradually grow. Yeah. But that, that allows you to be authentic in these most so that you can bring authenticity into bigger, because you don't know how many people are going to yep. be in an interview right. room with you, right? Right. So you've got to grow that. And so the earlier you can grow that, if you're if you're an introvert and being able to speak with one person, be authentic, you can grow this authenticity that, hey, that felt great. I was talking to my uncle about this. Like you do these little things and then it, it basically allows you to see like, oh, that, that was, that was good. Like that felt good. Now you do two people or however many, yeah. like a group of people. And now you're like, yeah, yeah. Wow. Look at this now. Right. I'm authentic and I can say, I'm, you know, I don't know this. I don't know that, but here's this thing. And here's this thing. Cause I've talked about it and now I feel comfortable being in a room with all these people yeah, and being able to chat with them. So That's awesome. Let's uh, go ahead and wrap this up. Before we do, though, I want to give you the chance to plug uh, whatever it is you want to plug again. Plug? Plug it. Um, Honestly, like I just want to say this. uh, I've really been thinking a lot about it is is design as, you know, my post and design being this meaningful solution in that anything that you do, if you're focusing on making something impactful, so, you know, have giving it meaning and things like that, I just think with people, when you go and interview and everything like that, your life and the meaning behind your life is you have to create that meaning in your own life as well as a product for a user. And so I guess what I would just plug is do things that are meaningful to you that you know will make an impact in your life. Don't worry about what Joe Schmo did and Jane over here did. You can to an extent of like, oh, I'd like to try that. But find things that you feel really confident in really yeah. like, like motivated by and explore those because then once you get in an interview with somebody, you have something to go off of yep. that you really feel and that will translate. I get it, man. So if uh, you're listening and you're interested, I'm sure you can reach out uh, to Dano on LinkedIn, uh, Calendly. Yeah. The Calendly link, which will be in the description can I again. I put that again in here? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, take advantage of it. I know a couple of people did last time, but uh, take up more of his time. I, I volunteer uh, all of Dano's time to be absorbed yeah. in his calendar. Tuesdays and Thursdays, just so everybody knows, in the evening from I don't know what time to what time, there's like three hours in the evening, is free. And it is like half hour blocks. And so obviously if you can do the math on that, which I'm not going to, uh, I got time. Tuesdays okay. and Thursdays. So. And if you can somehow get his phone number and his email, uh, text him at all hours of the night. Uh, go ahead and email him. Uh, set off whatever kind of triggers he can in the middle of the night for him. Uh, I'll give his phone number in the description. Bo- bother me. Uh, That's basically what we're saying. All right, Dano. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thank it's you so much. Again. Appreciate it. That's it. Thanks for watching this episode of Design Today. And don't forget to check back next week as I've got new episodes that I roll out every Tuesday morning. Your support via shares, comments, likes, and subscribes go a long way in helping me gain exposure. And I really do appreciate it. 
Uh, a reminder that if you watch on YouTube, there is a podcast version available that is convenient uh, when you're sitting at your desk working. Or if you're a podcast listener, you can see me, my guests, and our smiling faces on the YouTube channel. In either case, just search Design Today and subscribe. If you're interested in sponsoring, collaborating, or feel like you've got a message that would be beneficial for the show, always feel free to reach out and connect.